Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dr. Nehar Nayak, for having invited me to participate in this uh, seminar. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've just come back uh, from Colombo in the morning, and a few weeks ago I was in Kathmandu. So, you know, there's a popular expression in South Asia which says, you are interlocked in the intestine of each other. So <laughs> I'm also equally interlocked in the intestine of IDSA, having spent uh, 18 years here and on a temporary sort of engagement um, at the Nehru Memorial. And I think both Nehru Memorial and IDSA are great discursive places where ideas are sort of brought forth. Um, conventions are challenged, and that's, that's quite important. When I joined IDSA in 2001, I joined with a baggage of thesis that I had, and that thesis was about comparative study between uh, political conflicts and environmental conflicts. And, and you know, IDS is regarded as a very hardcore security institute, and I was sort of entering into IDS meant breaching that citadel of how we looked at security from a very hard, conventional, state-centric approach. And I think this progression that has happened over the years, and this is a larger progression that has happened globally about sort of understanding and, and contesting uh, the security issues, is it's, it's quite fascinating when we look at things in the 21st century. Um, in the Nehru Memorial, there's always the contemporariness of history, which we cannot forget. In IDSA, unraveling the complexities of security is something that is that goes does not go amiss here and i think that is something very important uh, to uh, to sort of reflect upon um, dr behuria contextualized in a certain manner uh, what non traditional security is let me in a very true academic spirit conceptualize it contextualize it and problematize it you know so let's sort of investigate how um, uh, security issues in the 21st century has sort of changed. The topic to speak is rebalancing state versus human security. I'm not very comfortable with the word versus. I think I think we we do not have to see security in a dichotomous manner, uh, in a polarized sense, uh, as binaries. And I think we've often looked at security from such a, such a lens: this and that me and you, us and them. I think that, that narrative is, is strongly being challenged in the 21st century. And, and this therefore makes uh, the whole understanding of security uh, not only interesting, but, but at a very methodological level, very perplexing. And, and the challenge at the policy level uh, becomes uh, even more uh, intricate and challenging. Let me begin with a little bit of history. It's always good to begin with history uh, in some sense. And I'll take you back to 1755, uh, the great Lisbon earthquake. Uh, it sort of brought the city down to its knees. Um, you may recall and remember that by that time, the Portuguese empire has sort of expanded to four continents, from Rio to Macau. It had tremendous amount of footprints. It had sailed around, you know, the world, and sort of established its dominance. By 1755, Lisbon was a powerful city in many sense. It was the fourth populous city in Europe. It had the third busiest port, and probably, from all account, it was the wealthiest city in the world. And then the earthquake happened. It destroyed the city. Not only did it destroy the city, it sort of, in some sense, terminated the growth of the Portuguese empire. Now, had the earthquake not happened, we would have had a different colonial history. Possibly not the British empire, but maybe the progression of, of the Portuguese empire itself. It's interesting because when you look at the 21st century as a century of interconnected risks and vulnerability. The situation of 1755 is a very interesting uh, sort of comparative study. 
I think the earthquake of 1755 has been a precursor to many things that unfolds in the 21st century. The whole concept of disaster risk management, in a sense, links to that period of time. This period of time is also the age of enlightenment, when, when conventional questions are being asked. Who should rule over whom? What should be the nature of power? What is the interaction between the state and society? I think that enlightenment period in Europe brought in a lot of questioning ability in, in the human and state relationship. And, and one of the things that happened after the Portuguese, uh, after the Lisbon earthquake, was this whole administrative investment in, in post-disaster management situations. You know, how do you uplift the city itself? What kind of role the state and the ruler uh, should play? There was a very interesting character uh, in Portugal that time, in Lisbon, who took control and command of the situation, Marquês de Pombal. You know, his command was so authoritative that he almost became a despot. But the idea was not his despotism. The idea was post-disaster risk management. Forget about the dead, concentrate on the living. You know, so that became a fundamental driver to, to many of the understandings. And remember, it was also the age of Rousseau, Voltaire, and later on Immanuel Kant, who brought in an element of intellectual investment into the way we should conceive of the world. The earthquake was not a matter of providence. It wasn't God's punishment to a sinful Lisbon. It was more the rationality of how we plan our towns, what kind of structures we build. Voltaire and Rousseau quite clearly identify in some of their work that the way Lisbon City has grown made it very vulnerable to disasters itself. And that's the kind of thinking that happened then. Immanuel Kant, for example, set the whole theme of seismology and how it should be sort of related to the field of science and the evolution of science itself. So I think there was a movement towards a sociological theory of disasters and vulnerability, which came about also through a great deal of state's responsibility in the prevention of such occurrences. And I think this is something which we must take note of when we come to the 21st century, that the the strength of the society also comes from the awakening. Uh, the strength of the state comes from the awakening of the society itself. And that kind of partnership and interaction is something that is critically important when you look at security from a, from a complex lens. So in the 21st century, uh, we describe this century as an age of risk. We are all, in some sense, to use the popular a phrase of Ulrich Beck, a risk society in many sense. No, no country is an island in that sense. Everyone is connected to vulnerability. And the distances therefore has shrunk in that, not in the physical sense, but in the sense of vulnerability and risk. Something that happens in the Arctic has tremendous impact on the, on the Himalayan glaciers, which has a great impact on the monsoon, and that has a greater impact on the distribution and rainfall, and therefore the patterns of agriculture. So this, this interlink, this connecting the dot, is so, uh, so complex in the 21st century that we really need to put our mind uh, onto it. And, and, and I keep saying it's not about demarcating security or making differences in security issues. It's about synthesizing those issues together, and I explain why. We also live in a time where we describe ourselves as the age of the Anthropocene. The, the human impact on, on the system around us is, is now evidenced very clearly. Uh, and, and, and therefore, we take a larger responsibility as an agency, human as an agency, and its impact on the environment is, is also quite mind-boggling. A lot of reports suggest that we are going through what is called the sixth extinction extinction period you know where uh, you know um, um, where there's been a frightening assault on the on the foundation of human civilization you know the biological annihilation so this is the time we're living in you know? 
with the kind of knowledge uh, that we have on these uh, sort of understanding. And therefore, to to put the lens on security issues, to to understand it in in the sense of its concept, and 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 how problematic it is, is is very very important for us. More so in South Asian context, uh, you know. Um, in in Colombo, Asanga, you remember, someone said, um, uh, "India is South Asia, and South Asia is India." You know. Such kind of notion and such kind of understanding and looking at the region itself, conceived through through hegemonic tendencies and ideas, conceived through power structures, are quite relevant. I mean, one cannot dismiss this fact. But the fact is that South Asia is quite vul vulnerable in many sense, in sense of climate change, in sense of sea level rises. We only heard reports from Nepal saying that the Himalayan mountain, uh, you know, is, is fast degrading. And imagine what happens if the Himalayan mountains fast degrades. It's not all, only about the rivers that flow out through the, <laughs> through the Himalayan system, but it, it also changes the pattern of the monsoon and makes it erratic and difficult to understand. So I think we have to realize in the, uh, in the, in the 21st century that, that security cannot be just judged in black and white. You know, its complexities has to be understood. Let me just shoot out some figures uh, to make you um, understand um, how difficult it is to live in the 21st century, you know, uh, apart from whatever the societal divide of the rich and the poor. Just look at the numbers. Um, in the post-Cold War 1994 to 2013, that's 20 years, 103 million lives were lost due to natural disasters. 103 million lives, that accounts for 68,000 people dying every year. And this discounts the difficulty of other people, the dislocated and the miseries that happen and the material loss that happens from natural disasters. Um, if you look at the food agricultural figures of 2017, there are 821 million globally people facing chronic food deprivation. That's a huge number. And I think these are the numbers that will really challenge the way we look at security issues. Security for whom? From a limited set of people who view security from a state-centric uh, fashion, in a conventional, hard, military sense. It has its meaning. It has its relevance. It's not to dismiss that idea. But we cannot equally dismiss the fact that there's a larger sort of people concerned and the issues that needs to be addressed. Uh, how do we address that? It's something that I'll probably come to, and that is what the problematization of, of security issues is. Contrast all these figures to, to one important figure, and that is that 108 million people have died in wars throughout the 20th century. So the wars really hasn't produced the kind of death that other issues produce, and therefore the figure itself becomes quite challenging and daunting and of, of concern. Because it's not about the dead. It's about how difficult the livings are. You know, and that needs to be addressed in a certain manner, whether it's nat you know, natural disaster, whether it's poverty, or whether it's hunger. It's the living that, that's, that's quite, uh, quite important. And I, and I can just recount uh, King Lear, uh, you know, the classic work by Shakespeare. And King Lear asks, the blind Duke of Gloucester, that how does he look at the world? His blind Duke of Gloucester. And he asks him, how do you look at the world? And he says, with feeling. And I think probably in the 21st century, I mean, this is a very emotive thing, really, but we don't conceive things from a feeling perspective. And I think, therefore, the divide uh, between the rich and the poor, the divide between the underprivileged and the privileged, keeps growing. And greater the divide, more the challenge it will be on, on, on issues to say uh, security uh, dynamics. There's a very interesting uh, report by The Economist, uh, The Economist Intelligence Unit in 2017. And they've done a sort of survey uh, asking academicians, asking corporate honchos, asking politicians and leaders that, uh, to list you know, the challenges in the next five years. And, and 
And the listing doesn't have a huge difference in terms of uh, the percentage of people claiming for a certain issue. The first listing is political and ideological differences within countries. Within countries, that's, that's very important, and not just between international borders. Second issue is poverty and high level of income inequalities. The third is scarcity of key resources. The fourth is low levels of education. The fifth is disruption caused by migration flows. And I think pollution and environmental sort of degradation comes a bit later. What it does mean is that most of the risks have, have societal causes. Right? And when dealing with this, it becomes even more difficult. Why? Because you won't generally get a lack of agreement on how best to address this complex societal issues. Uh, sometimes the government or the state will not have the adequate resources to deal with it. Right? But more important and fundamentally that we have to realize is that sometimes there's a lack of skill and the lack of knowledge to do so. And I think this is an area where we need to bring in more sort of knowledge-based and evidence-driven sort of research in, into the fold of policy. Not to just state that this is a non-traditional issue and this is a critical issue and this is a crucial issue, but that has to be really backed by comprehensive data, evidence research, that, that moves more towards solution-based understanding. You know. So I think while conceptually and contextually one can, from an academic perspective, discuss security issues, probably at the end of the day, uh, research with legs towards uh, uh, data as facts, figures, authentic data as facts and figures, not misinformation, would probably be an important driver. So, so what does Lisbon earthquake, I'm just getting back again to 75, tell us? And there are two broad contexts. Uh, one is that uh, nothing is predetermined. But everything is a complexity. And complexity, the good thing about complexity is that it allows for you know, convergence of thoughts and ideas to sort of overcome some of the challenges of time. The second uh, point here is, what is it to be human and, and therefore to reclaim humanity is an important principle in the 21st century world. I think these two broad contexts sets a number of questions uh, that is first and foremost the political mindscape. How does the political mindscape or the state mindscape deal with such kind of almost metaphysical in its orientation to reclaim humanity? Does it really make sense uh, for the state to think in such a manner? One would argue strongly yes, but a lot of people would argue that no, state is defined by a certain role. It is defined by a certain intellectual coherence and, and, and therefore, we should, we should not forget that. We can't, we can't frame state's role in a certain intellectual incoherent manner that everything becomes disruptive and, and not understood. But let me, and then we have in, in the post-Cold War, you know, defining documents uh, by the United Nations Security Council on, on what constitutes uh, environmental issues. And then the UNDP report of 1994 is, is quite fundamental to the way we look at security issues today. And, and that sort of brings in a whole array of issues, uh, which are basically social-driven issues, economic, uh, health, food, etc. cetera. And, and, and from a human uh, security perspective, it was argued that humans should therefore become the referent object. I mean, it seemed rather practical and purposeful, especially in the post-Cold War, especially when it was a period of sort of uh, institution building, there were peace dividends. I think it was a good sort of space to articulate some of these issues which were hidden and, and ignored and sort of sent on the margins during the, the Cold War period. I think the whole new enlightenment process of security thinking, I think, comes about in the post-Cold po uh, post War period, which is um, something uh, interesting to note. Uh, and I have a few minutes. Uh, so what is the big research question? Uh, does everything need to be treated as a security concern? I think this is a question that will emerge uh, um, uh, constantly. Uh, is it useful or helpful? 
to treat everything as a security issue uh does security not need certain coherence and that you know the separation of security issues makes policy formulation that much more difficult and if you don't have uh robust policy formulations uh then you go nowhere um but i think the the broader we define security the longer the list becomes uh, and that itself is a challenge so how do we overcome this this huge divide i think the best way forward would be what is called you know optimality of uh, the whole issue you know search for the middle ground between what is hard and and what is not hard and and therefore uh, uh, seek to replace or undermine the role of the state or the importance of national security and i think to do so one of the fundamental exercise that we as an academics and researchers will have to do is is to categorize what is important and not important what is a uh, um a uh, significant and non significant and this categorization would probably be an important element in which we sort of uh, uh list out uh, the crucibles of of non traditional issues i think sometimes the lens also has to focus on certain issues from the frame of you know the cost of non cooperation if we do not cooperate on say certain issues like water or on certain issues like climate change what would be the cost of that non cooperation and this cost benefit analysis along with you know the net assessment and, and various other methodologies that is used uh becomes critical to sort of place issues uh, together um and i think it will be useful an idsc and orf did one a substantial report on on the institutional structure for joint action in the sundarban and it's at a draft stage but when this thing comes out in a in a few months i think you will clearly understand that the emphasis is on the cost of non cooperation if we do not cooperate in in an ecosystem called the sundarban what are the sociological cost what are the economical cost what are therefore then the political cost and i think this cost benefit analysis uh, in terms of categorizing issues uh, will be quite important also to differentiate between what is zero sum and non zero sum game is also very important i think that again that lens would help us to understand uh, which issues uh, uh, are therefore needed in in the context of of climate change uh, in the context of security and i think this whole exercise and i'll just wind up would uh, obviously have to come about uh, through the larger change not only on our mindset but the way we do thinking and i think it will be primarily based on a larger and a greater interdisciplinary approach to certain issues i think no subject can command that kind of supreme status to find solution to a particular thing and i think the interdisciplinary approach followed then by a more institutional reinvigoration uh you know based on the kind of knowledge that comes to us will help bringing in and studying these uh, issues and lastly i think a lot will also depend upon you know transparency and information sharing of these issues so that that makes security therefore a very robust and and an and an important uh, sort of theme in which we do not look at it in a polarized way but we start integrating many issues in a precise knowledge based approach thank you very much